Let's continue the special senses by looking at the eyes. Eyes and vision are very important. I believe somewhere around 90% of the sensations we're consciously aware of come in through our eyes. These are very big with the special senses. Before we get to the eyes themselves, let's look at what's called the accessory structures of the eye. Now, the accessory structures of the eye are structures closely associated with the eye, but you don't actually see with them. So we're talking about things like eyebrows, eyelids, eyelashes, and so on. But looking back at the eyebrows, think about those up at the superior borders or margins of your eye and why you have them. Get outside where it's very bright, you tend to squint and you pull them down and it tends to shade the eyes, keeping too much light from entering them. And at the same time as you sweat, it helps to move that perspiration laterally. That way, hopefully, it doesn't get into your eyes and cause irritation. But there's also the eyelids called the palpebrae. So, of course, you got two of them. So you have a superior and inferior palpebrae. And there's very thin epithelial layers lining the inside of them. That's what the conjunctive layers are. Now, just below that, we see on our list right here the palpebral fissures. Now, fissures are crack or a space. So anytime your eyes are open, the space in between those palpebrae, the space between your eyelids, is what the palpebral fissure is. The canthi are the corners. Think about the lateral and medial margins of your eyes, where they sort of come, sort of come together at a point. That's the cantha. So there's a lateral and medial to either side right there. There's a medial canthus at the inside, say closest to your nose, you know what medial means, where there's a structure called the caruncle, a little small pinkish mound of tissue where we have some modified sweat and sebaceous glands. And there's also five different layers of tissue in the eyelid. One of those is a dense connective tissue layer called the tarsal plate. Gives the eyelid some shape and structure. Just below that, we have the eyelashes. You look at these two or three rows of hairs, they help to keep things off the surface of the eye. Think about something very tiny coming towards your eye will often make you blink. Those eyelashes can help to keep that from getting to your eyes. They're associated with little ciliary glands, which are modified sweat glands, which help to keep these eyelashes moist. They get very dry, they tend to crack and break, and they're lost quicker. These meibomian glands will produce sebum, an oil that coats the surface of those eyelashes. Just like any hair gets dry, gets brittle, breaks, this will help to prevent that. And then you also have these two different conjunctive layers mentioned down here. Now, these are very thin epithelial cell layers, mucous membranes. You've seen those before in other places. Where there are palpebral conjunctive layers that cover the very inner lining, very inner surface of both your eyelids. But then there's a bulbar conjunctive layer that covers the surface of your eye. Remember, epithelial tissues like to cover, line, and protect things. And that's exactly what they're doing on the inside of your eyelids and the surface of the eye, too. But look at this model right here. It's some of the major structures of the eye. The sclera is the white of the eye. That's what surrounds most all the eye. Very tough collagenous connective tissue layer. It's also the insertion for the muscles that move your eyes that we'll look at further along. Here's the cornea at the very front of your eye. Notice how it's sort of dome-shaped. Helps to bring light into the eye the way you need it. The anterior chamber is this little space just behind it. And that chamber that's found there is just between the cornea and the iris. So right behind the cornea and anterior chamber is the iris. That's the part of your eye that's colored blue, green, brown, or whatever that may be. you got melanocytes making melanin, giving it that color. And mostly what that iris is is smooth muscle that controls the size of your pupil. Now, your pupil you can't really see in this picture, but that's a hole right in the very front center of your iris. That's how light gets into your eye through that region. But right back behind that iris is the posterior chamber. And then right behind it is the lens. That lens is a highly elastic structure that allows you to focus on objects closer than 20 feet. that will be covered further along. Right below it here are the ciliary bodies, which have little ligaments that attach to this lens. And when this muscle pulls on that lens, that'll thin it out. When they relax and move forward, excuse me, when they contract and move forward, that'll thicken the lens. Well, look at how that changes your focus further along. Then over here to the top right, there's the vitreous chamber filled with humors, which are fluids, sort of jelly-like, a little bit thick in this region. Here's our retinal artery and vein, and here's our optic nerve. Lots of axons passing back from all these rods and cones, little photoreceptive cells in the retina, which we'll look at further. 
The choroid is a highly vascular layer. You can actually see the blood vessels in that layer behind the retina. If you ever see a picture of somebody's retina, you can easily see those blood vessels posterior behind it. And then there again is that sclera, that tough white outer layer that we mentioned before. Now let's look also at the lacrimal apparatus. Here we're talking about your tear glands and all the ducts and structures associated with them. So with each eye, you've got a big lacrimal gland. You can see one of them in this picture right here. Always producing fluid, what we call tears over the surface of the eye. It's a very delicate structure, especially anterior to the front. So it's going to keep it moist if it dries out. Think about you get on a uh, outside where it's very dry and windy and the eyes dry out, you can feel that irritation. It's going to moisten and lubricate and at the same time wash the surface of the eye. You put these fluids on the eye and every time you blink, it's just like windshield wipers that will be cleaning them. But right to the very medial corners, there will be a little hole or passageway called the nasolacrimal duct, which passes through the lacrimal bones. Not shown in this picture right here, but there will be a hole medially. And right inside that little passageway and duct, there will be tiny canals, the lacrimal canaliculi. Well, there'll be a little hole called the puncta where those canals start, and then those canals travel further into the nasal cavity. So moisture off your eyes, a lot of that actually ends up inside your nasal cavity, and that fluid enters right at those inferior nasal conch. So that's why when you have excessive moisture like tears on your eyes that your nose will run because these passageways collect that fluid, bring it into your nose, and you want the inside of the nasal cavity to be damp. That way it'll catch and trout dust and other particles as you breathe them in. But let's look also at the muscles that move your eye around. These are what's called the extrinsic muscles, the ones on the outside of the eye. So there's six of these extrinsic muscles. There are four rectus muscles and two oblique. Now the four rectus muscles, rectus means straight because they run straight from the back to the front of the eye. The four rectus muscles are located superior on top, inferior on bottom, medial to the inside, and lateral to the outside. And wherever those rectus muscles are located, that's where they move the eye. So in other words, if this superior rectus contracts, you look up in a superior direction. If the inferior rectus contracts, you look down in an inferior direction. If the medial rectus contracts, that draws your gaze inward. Your eyes move, say, uh, towards your nose. And then, of course, lateral draws it to the outside. But there's also these two oblique muscles which move the eyes around too. And these obliques are on top and bottom. There's a superior and an inferior oblique. And these muscles move the eyes in the opposite direction in which they're located. So in other words, the superior oblique causes you to look down, just like that inferior rectus does. And the inferior oblique will cause you to look up, just like the superior rectus does. So those muscles insert into the white of the eye, which is the sclera. That's what they're pulling on when your eyes move up, down, left, right, and so on. Looking just a little more at the anatomy of the eye, it actually has three different layers to it. There's a fibrous layer that contains the sclera and the cornea. There is the vascular layer with the choroid, ciliary body, and iris. And then there's the nervous layer with the retina filled with rods and cones. Those are the neurons that actually give you your vision. But looking back at this outer fibrous layer we call the sclera, very strong outer layer, helps to maintain the shape of the eye, protects those more delicate internal structures. As we said, the extrinsic muscles that move the eye around have their insertion here. The intrinsic muscles of the eye are found in the iris and deeper inside. We'll see those further along. But lots of collagen here, making it the very strong outer layer. Then again, there's that cornea. To the very front, it's very dome shaped, helps to bring that light in in a very particular way. That way it all comes to a point. We'll look at that more with how our vision works further along. But again, there's a layer here found with proteoglycans, lots of fluids. You don't want too much water in this region, that would actually scatter the light and cause problems with vision, but you have to have a certain amount. And in this cornea also, you won't find any blood vessels. That would scatter the light also, that would not be good for your vision. But look at that vascular layer. This is the middle layer. Lots of blood vessels in this region. And right up to the very front, you'll find the iris. Now again, look just to the very front. There's the cornea. Then right back behind it is going to be the iris. And again, that's that part of your eye that's got the color in it, green, blue, brown, whatever that may be. 
But largely what that iris is, is muscle. There's two different layers of smooth muscle. There's a sphincter papillae group, which is controlled by the parasympathetic division, that'll constrict the iris. That'll make the pupil, the hole in the center of it, smaller. That way less light comes in. There's too much light around your eyes, you can't see well. It's like somebody puts a bright light in your face. So the muscle in that iris and that sphincter group will constrict. That way less light comes in. That'll help with your vision. But then if you get into a dark area, the dilator group will contract. That's the sympathetic control. That'll dilate or open up that pupil, which is that hole in the center of the iris. And that'll let more light in. And that's what you need if you're in a dark region. Also associated with this iris, uh, right back deeper to it, it's the ciliary bodies. These produce these humors and fluids that fill that anterior chamber. We saw that on another picture just before. And there's the ciliary muscles located deeper that control the lens. You have to change the thickness of the lens if you want to focus on near objects. We're going to look at that further along. But these ciliary muscles have little ligaments attached to that lens. And that's what allows them to pull on them. And then again, is that choroid layer we mentioned and showed before. There's two different layers when you look at the nervous system layer itself. There's a pigmented layer within the retina. It's where you have some simple cuboidal cells and some pigment. Again, that'll help to catch and trap the light, keep it from scattering too much. And then there's a sensory retina region filled with rods and cones. These little sensory neurons here detect different wavelengths of light. We're going to look at those more further along. The rods are good in low light conditions, but they don't give you good color vision, more of like a black and white. Sort of like if you were ever maybe outside very late after the sun had gone down and it was almost dark, you can see where things are at, but they're pretty much just shades of gray. There's no color in them. But then when there is plenty of light around your eyes, the cones work, and that gives us our color vision. So you got to have a lot of light for those cones, but they give you the better vision too. Looking at the lens itself, it's going to focus light back deeper in the eye on this region called the macula lutea. It looks like a little bit of a yellow spot if you look in someone's eye. And right at the center of it is a region called the fovea centralis. Here's where you have a very big collection of these cones. That gives you very good sharp vision. Whenever you're looking directly at something, that's where you've got that light being projected is in that region there. And the optic disc is what people sometimes also call their blind spot. But optic disc is that region where that optic nerve enters your eye. Now right there at that optic disc, you don't have any rods or cones. So anytime light is over that region, you can't see anything at that time. But since you got two eyes and where the light's at and one eye is not the same as the other, that blind spot's almost never a problem. Looking at different chambers, we mentioned the anterior chamber, that's between the cornea and the iris, the posterior deepers between the iris and the lens. And when you look at the fluids in these chambers, they help to keep just the right amount of pressure to keep the eye just the right shape. Otherwise, you'd have trouble with your vision. Back deeper, we see these ciliary processes producing these fluids. And the way these fluids get out of your eye, they're always being made are at the very top front and top bottom of your eyes, there are these tiny little holes called the canal of Schlem, also called the scleral venous sinus. That's how the fluids get out of your eye, and sometimes proteins and other materials can clog those little canals or passageways. The fluid can't get out and causes too much pressure inside the eye, changing its shape, and that's what causes glaucoma. But back to the rear, in that biggest chamber to the back of the eye, that posterior compartment, it's fluid in this region too. It's a little thick, little jelly-like that helps to keep just the right amount of pressure too, helps to hold the lens in place, also pushes back on that retina to hold it, and has a little bit to do with the refraction of light. But back to that lens, it should be a very elastic structure. When we're young, it is. As we get older and lose that elasticity, that's generally when we need reading glasses because we have to change the thickness of that lens to focus on near objects. So we'll look at that further along too. But again, the ciliary muscles have a little suspensory ligaments attached to this lens, which can pull on it to make it thinner, let off the little tension, or actually when they contract, they come closer and let off the tension. We'll see that further along. But it's very transparent. If it wasn't, the light wouldn't get through it easily. And with this transparent biconvex shape, it'll bring the light together to a point. And you'll see that those light rays cross over and actually reflect uh, upside down on the back of your eye at the retina. 
So everything we see is actually upside down on a retina, but sometimes, somehow our brain always flips that upright.